I'm AJ Bianco, host of Reflect Ed, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Just like the show you're listening to now, shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to episode 119 of the Google Teacher Podcast, your source for the latest Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I'm Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And I'm Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And in today's episode, we are sharing your tips. These are the tips that the listeners have shared with us. So this is actually my favorite kind of episode. This is the episode where Matt and I get to sit back and just share the wonderfulness of all of you, our listeners, as part of the Google Teacher Podcast. So we've got some Google Teacher tips for you as well as some Google News and Updates and a few things that are going on on the blogs. So are you ready for this, Matt? I am so excited. Yeah, let's do it. So to kick off our Google News and Updates, you might start to see a little change in your Gmail layout. If you're using Gmail for your email, there is going to be a new Quick Settings menu. And this is going to be able to be displayed on the right side of your screen when you click on the settings. And then you'll be able to see different interfaces, um, different inbox types, different display options. And what's kind of cool about it is when you click on this settings button, button and it opens up this sidebar, whenever you click on click to change one of those settings, it automatically applies it to your screen so you can see whether you like it or not. And so... Um, it's kind of like that old old idea of what you see is what you get. You know, you click on it, you change it, and you go, eh, I don't really like that. And then you can go change it back. And then you just close out that sidebar. So it really makes it easy and fast to be able to customize your uh, inbox in ways that you may not have realized uh, just because it's available right there. So this is a pretty cool little feature, pretty simple one. Um, it should be rolling out to rapid release domains as soon as you've... Um, heard this, it it should be going out in the end of May 2020. And then to scheduled release domains, it'll be out into later June, something like June 28th, 22nd, something like that. So um, keep an eye out for that. And uh, that'll help you customize your inbox just the way that you want it. I always appreciate a little update to Gmail to make it just a little bit better because I spend so much time in my inbox. Our next update is something that's going to require some work on my part. I've got to update some lessons, but I think we'll continue the Google Meet, the Google Hangouts chat, and we are going to switch gears. And now Google has launched a standalone Google Chat app. (laughs) So it is a web-based application you can they said install it i didn't it didn't really require for me to install anything when i went to chat.google.com it pretty much just loaded for me but it does have to be enabled by your domain it's available now for everyone it's supposed to be fast reliable and an engaging way to use chat i did see mention when i was launching this that you can set up rooms. So I'm guessing rooms are kind of like the groups that we have used inside Hangouts chat. And my guess is the word Hangouts is now going to leave our vocabulary completely. I'm still I'm still going to rebel against meat, but at least this one's just <laughs> called chat. So I, I can handle that. Google chat. We got it. And it's supposed to be, you know, secure and fast and easy to distribute. Works on um, the Google Chrome browser version 73 and up. So that was actually remo- uh, released way back in March 2019. So you would have to have a pretty old device that hasn't been turned on in a while to be running something that can't actually run this. So I think this will be handy. I think more teachers are taking advantage of chats and things like this, both professionally to communicate within their campuses and with other teachers and staff, 
but also in terms of supporting students remotely. So this may come in handy with chatting with students or parents as well. Um, Don't really know specifics on where this may be going with students, but my guess is that we will be able to enable this um, through our domains for them as well. Nice. Very good. Always nice to have some new features and adding new things to our Google vocabulary. Now we've got Google chat as well. So the next thing we wanted to share with you has to do with Chromebooks. And if you have Chromebooks in your home and if you've got kids, this is kind of a family feature. If you haven't heard about Family Link on Chromebooks, um, this is an app that you can add. It works through Android and iOS, and it's basically an option that you can use to manage the way that your student, not your students, but your children, <laughs> see that word students just popped right out of my mouth, um, the way that you, your children use Chromebooks. And so it gives you as a parent some options to to manage those. So this could be helpful if you are an educator and have your own kids at home, or if you want to you know, give some advice and some support to some of the parents of the students that you work with. And so among the features that they they mention in this post, uh, one is giving you the option of basically approving and denying apps and themes and extensions and different things in the Chrome web store. And so um, what you can do there is you, you basically get the opportunity to approve of certain extensions um, by just entering a password. So if you're familiar with in the school setting, you know, having certain extensions blocked and certain things approved, this is going to give you some similarities as a parent. And then the other thing that's really cool is it helps you create healthy guardrails for certain apps on a Chromebook. And so basically what the Chromebook will do through Family Link is it will keep an eye on um, children's screen time in certain apps or just in general. And so it gives gives parents more precise control over app usage so you can strike the right balance on um, the time that they spend in certain educational apps or games or different things like that. So if you're not familiar with Family Link and if you've got kids at home or if you know somebody with kids at home that uses Chromebooks, this could be a really, really useful thing. I may need this because I think I have too much screen time, Matt. (laughs) Somebody needs to throttle me, get me off of the technology. I think I'm going to have to go on a digital diet pretty soon. This has been a lot. I have another announcement that I'm pretty excited about that the new Google Groups is now generally available, although I will say I hate it when they give it that title, like that's the least sexy title in the world, (laughs) generally available. New Google Groups, I have been waiting for years. I'm like, when are they going to update groups? Because it's been the same for like, I swear, at least six or seven years. So the new Google Groups is now available. It was previously only in beta, but as of May 26, which is after this I mean, we've already passed that date. You can turn this on or off in the admin console. So you can make this available for your G G Suite users. Or if you're using it with your personal account like I am, I'm hoping to be able to, to start making use of some of these new features. Although it still looks like they haven't exactly rolled everything out. There's a little bit of of stuff that's still in beta, but it has a, a little bit of a slicker new look. It's kind of looked antiquated for quite a while. So this is one of those things, like I said, I'm excited just because I'm so tired of looking at the same old way of using groups. But Google Groups, if you're not familiar, groups.google.com has been a great way to have discussion board types of conversations. And that's not something that works as well in Google Classroom. It doesn't thread it the same way like a discussion board is. So if you haven't explored this as an app, it may be time to look at this, especially as we're trying to set up some asynchronous communications um, within our schools. It could be very helpful. Yeah, that sounds really, really cool. Um, It seems like there hasn't been, just like what you're saying, there hasn't been a really good solution to this kind of thing. And so hopefully this will will really help us out. So um, if you want to check out more information about any of these things, of course, you can go to our show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 119. So 
So, Matt, we usually jump into the mailbag. And since this is sort of the mailbag, but it's focused on tips, are we jumping into the tip bag today? I don't know. We are, <laughs> we are jumping into it all. I don't know. Y'all, we're crazy. We have all been cooped up for so long and Casey's had too much coffee today. So this is going to be fun. The first tip I have to share is from my friend Susan Vincent from Kentucky. And Susan is sharing a really great Screencastify tip. If you've never used Screencastify, it's pretty fantastic. And they keep adding some really cool features. But Susan's going to tell you how you can extract the audio if that's all you need. So take it away, Susan. Hey, Susan Vincent's here for the Google Teacher Podcast Tech Share. And I'm excited to share um, a tool that might be just a little hidden that nobody always realizes is there. Sometimes there are um, incidences when you need to just record audio only instead of video. And I know many of you have been recording videos during this distance learning time. If you open your Screencastify extension and you record a video, and it can be just you saying, um, using your voice, whatever you need to say. And once you stop that recording, um, remember that it always goes to your Google Drive. And then you have the option of publishing to YouTube and sharing to Classroom. And if you scroll just a little further down under those options, there's a download section. And if you drop that download menu down, it gives you the um, option to export audio only. So that's just a little known little hidden gem there in Screencastify um, that where you can export audio only when you don't necessarily need a video file. So quick and easy tech tip there. Enjoy and happy teching. Love it. Quick, simple, easy to use. And yes, there is power in audio. Isn't this podcast the perfect example? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think so. Very good. Good tip. Thank you for that, Susan. By the way, you said if it's we were jumping into the mailbag, but this is tips. Does that mean that we're jumping into the tip jar? Tip jar. I said tip bag. Tip jar sounds a little bit better, but much more challenging. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. I don't know. So, okay, very good. Well, I wanted to jump into this next one in the next part of our tip jar. Um, this one's from Stephanie Howell from Ohio, who always has lots of really good ideas. And she has some thoughts about Google Educator Group. So Stephanie, take it away. Hey, it's Stephanie Howe from Pickerington Local School District. I really suggest that you join your local GAG. GAG stands for Google Educator Groups. And what it is, is it's just people gathering together to collaborate, talk about Google, and really build that community to expand your knowledge. You're no longer working in a silo and you're working as a group collaboratively together. You're stealing ideas, you're building on those ideas, and you're supporting and cheering others on. It's an amazing community. Um, I currently lead the Ohio GEG um, with Eric Kurtz, but also thinking about this globally. So recently, me and a group of people, um, we started a global gag. And so what global gag is supporting those local gags. So supporting those local Google groups for education. And what we do is we host events together. So it's not just for Ohio. It's not just for people in London, UK. It's not just for people in California. All of these groups of people are able to come together and communicate with one another to grow and learn and build upon each other's ideas. This has really built me up as an educator because I was so in my own little world. Now, when I talk to people all the way from California, I can get their perspective on how they solve problems and use that idea to better solve my problems in my own little world. So definitely get into a gag. Um, If you need resources, they will be in the show notes. Yes, this is so good. So important. If you haven't found out about Google Educator Groups, if you haven't found one in your area, and maybe now is a great time to do it. And I know lots of folks have, um, you know, really built up their personal learning networks and have really you know, built a sense of community around those. And so um, we do have a link in the show notes, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, for some more information about Google Educator Groups. So definitely go check that out. Our next tip comes to us from Down Under. So we have Katie Wardrobe from Melbourne, Australia, and she is sharing a really cool Chrome extension that lets you do some super cool things with YouTube and Vimeo videos. So take it away, Katie. 
Hi, Matt and Casey. It's Katie here from the Music Tech Teacher Podcast with a tip for your final episode. I thought I'd share a Chrome extension that I discovered a few months ago, which is called Transpose. And once you've installed the Transpose extension, it gives you a little control panel that you can use on YouTube and Vimeo videos. You basically open up the video and then you can open up the Transpose control panel to do things like change the playback speed of a YouTube video or transpose the music video up or down a little bit if you need it in a different key. And one of my favourite things is that you can set up a playback loop in the video that you're watching. So this is super useful for music students who might be practising a song and they need to play a small section over and over and over to get it right. But I think it would also be useful perhaps for language learners and people doing reading practice. So hopefully other people might find that useful. I've found it to be a really great one. And thank you so much for all that you do. I love listening to the podcast and I hope that you both enjoy your summer and think of us down here in Australia as we head into our winter. Bye for now. Can I just be in awe of the accent for a moment? (laughs) Love hearing your accent. Um, And what a great extension. I'm definitely going to have to check that out. I have not played with that before. Yeah, that sounds super, super cool. So we're going to continue with the international flavor here. We're going to be hearing from Darren White from England, and he's got a pretty cool solution for doing live streams with his students, but still maintaining connections and building community with them. So Darren, take it away. Hey, guys. It's Ranger the Trainer here, at Ranger the Trainer on Twitter. Uh, one of my favorite Google tips during this Uh, distance learning time has been using Google Forms and then the Google Sheets responses to maintain interaction with my students during live streamed lessons during Google Meet. So streaming the lesson and then sharing a form with them and then having the form responses coming back to me in the sheet so I'm able to respond and give the students shout outs for their correct answers, their birthdays and anything else that they want to call out, really raising that level of engagement. Thanks a lot. Keep going with the great work. Now, this is a pretty cool idea. If you've tried one of these streams, you know, streams are generally sort of one way communication. But if you set up a form and just keep an eye on the sheet that brings in all of the responses, that really does give you a good opportunity to shout out to your students and build in some interaction. So I thought that was a pretty clever idea. Yes, that's a different idea that I don't think a lot of people would have thought of using it that way. So thanks for that, Darren. We have another tip coming to us today from Arkansas. This is from Tanner Oglesby. And Tanner is reminding us of the power of Google Forms and how much it came in handy during this whole remote learning thing. So take it away, Tanner. Hi, my name is Tanner Oglesby, and I teach in uh, Central Arkansas, teach high school. I just wanted to give the tip of potentially using Google Forms as um, a database creator in Google Sheets. So I use Google Forms at the beginning of each year to get a bunch of new student information, parent, guardian, contact, all of that information um, into, I, I, I have the students fill out kind of a quiz of, to give me the information. Then I created Google Sheets and I use that sheet um, to be able to keep in contact with families in an easier way than having to go through my school database system. Um, and I found that during the remote learning situation, it has been super, super helpful. So I would just recommend um, using Google Forms to create a database on Sheets. And um, you can use the Command F feature to search a student quickly, find their parent, guardian, contact information. Um, it's just super, super helpful. Thought I'd help. Thanks. Isn't that a great reminder? So just the fact that we can feed all that information into a Google Sheet makes Google Forms so powerful. I always say they're like a married couple. When I teach these two apps, I always teach them together. They go hand in hand and can give us some really powerful data. So whether we're collecting parent information, contact information, we're doing some surveys, we're getting to know our kids definitely going to come in handy um, as we look into the fall and whatever the new normal is. Those are those really are so powerful when they work together. So our next message comes from Dan Stitzel from Ohio, and he's going to talk about one of his favorite tools and one of mine as well, uh, Google Keep and all of the flexible uses of it. So take it away, Dan. 
Hello, this is Dan Stitzel, a tech integration coach from Akron, Ohio. I think one of the best tools that just does not get used to its full potential all that often is Google Keep. Keep is excellent for personal organization and creating quick notes for yourself or checklists for yourself or copy and pasting links to go back and visit later. But it's excellent for sharing with other people as well. So you can actually share individual notes with a co-teacher. So let's say you want to brainstorm ideas for a lesson or a unit. You can share a note that you start and you can both add to it. Or you can create a checklist for a student, kind of help them stay you know, on task each day. And you can then share that individual checklist with that student. So just the two of you are seeing it. So you can kind of you know, communicate on what's getting done. One of the coolest features, though, that I'm not sure a lot of people know about is the location reminder feature. So you can rem- you can set reminders for time, so date and time, but you can also set reminders for picking a place, a specific location. So if you think of something at home and you want to remember when you get to work, you can set it so that when you get there, that reminder will pop up in your Google Keep. Or if you're like me and you travel from building to building, you can make it so that when you get to certain buildings, those certain notes will pop up so that you can then accomplish whatever that task is that you you noted in your Google Keep. Wow, that was a feature-packed recording. And so thank you, Dan, for sharing that with us. And I've got to agree with him. I think one of the cool, coolest, most magical uses of keep definitely has to be that location reminder feature that is pretty much like magic whenever i show that to somebody it always kind of blows their mind so hopefully you got some good reminders or some good ideas about using google keep from that so again dan thanks for sending that in oh yeah i love google keep i call it the instant pot (laughs) of g suite we already got the swiss army knife and google slides but keep is pretty powerful and does a lot more than what most people think so thanks for sharing that dan our next tip comes from anna cartwright in new york and she has a really interesting idea for getting students to highlight some text using google slides so take it away anna Hello, Matt and Casey. My name is Anna from Buffalo, New York, and my tip is about creating what I like to call highlighter strips in Google Slides. So Matt often gives the advice that you can save a reading as a JPEG and then lock it in as the background of your slide so it doesn't move around when students open the slide up and click on it. Um, So I like to start by doing that. And then in the gray space around the slide, I'll create um, a rectangle I'll fill it with a light color and then adjust the transparency of the rectangle so it's just over 50% transparent. Um, So now that rectangle is ready when you duplicate that slideshow to students as an assignment, um, they can hit Control D on that rectangle, drag it over the text, and use it to highlight something they want to highlight. Thank you. Bye totally get where she's going with this. And I would have never thought of that as a highlighter strip. So it's like having drag and drop little highlighter pieces that students can choose which parts of the text to highlight. So we can also see if they're getting the main points of what they're reading. So thanks for sharing that, Anna. And how cool is it that you get unlimited colors for your highlighters? I mean, could you imagine that having like a a great big (laughs) cup full of whatever color you want for your highlighters? That just there's a little nerdy side of me that really, really is excited about that. So anyway, uh, I digress. Uh, So our next message comes from Mike Muhammad, a friend of the podcast has been has been on several times from Wisconsin, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about Google Slides and adding audio. So take it away, Mike. Hi, I'm Matt and Casey. This is Mike, science teacher from Wisconsin. Just wanted to say again how much I love the podcast. Hearing your voices has been nice during this time of distance, virtual, whatever you want to call it, learning. My favorite tip, one of my favorite things that I've been using now that my students have been away from me for a while for myself and for my students is adding audio to Google Slides. And there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. And there's no wrong way, but I love using Cloud Audio Recorder to record quick snips of audio to Google Drive and then have students easily add them right into their slideshows or have me add them to the slideshows for instructions. Quick YouTube video that I made for it. But again, there's lots of people with resources out there I made a quick video for it at bit.ly slash 
add audio to slides all running together as one word. So thank you so much for everything you guys do during this time. And I hope this tip is useful for you. Yeah, this has been kind of like peanut butter and jelly when it comes to remote learning and adding audio to slides. Whenever you can add your voice or add video in your face, it just adds a new dimension to things, um, especially during remote learning that is just kind of missing otherwise. And so adding that audio, and that's a really good tip that, that Mike also gave us about using the cloud audio recorder. All good stuff. Thanks, Mike, for sending that in. Our next tip comes from Ronaldo Palacios in California, and he is reminding us of how we can see our students in one window during a Google Meet as well as share our screen. So if you've been a little bit confused, it's really hard when you're presenting online to see all the things that you need to see at once. And so Ronaldo has some tips here to share with you. So take it away. Okay, basically, uh, my name is Ronaldo Palacios, teacher at St. Michael Academy in San Diego. One of the things I like to do is in order to allow me to use uh, Google Meet uh, and um, share my whole screen at the same time and at the same time view, uh, continue viewing my students, is that I will use, um, I will open a, a second window, not just another tab, but um, I'll minimize it, open another window so I can have Google Meet on its own window and uh, whatever screen I'm trying to share on another window. This way, I, don't, I will not use uh, sight, lose sight of my students. And it has allowed me, I don't know if uh, now, I'm not sure if I saw, if I went back into Google Meet, if it will allow me to pop it out into a new window. But that's one hack that I've been using now, which allows me to share my full screen and at the same time continue to view my students on the side. And that's all. Yep. Such a good reminder. I forget that so many people don't think in terms of Windows. I am... I, I can't even count how many windows I have open right now, let alone the tabs. So it definitely <laughs> comes in handy when you're sharing your screen. So thanks for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, next one is another familiar face. You may remember her from episode 65 of the podcast. This is Pam Hubler from South Carolina, and she's going to talk about her favorite alternative to Google Calendar. Take it away, Pam. Hey, Matt and Casey, it's Pam Hubler or Special Techie on Twitter. I just wanted to check in with the Google Teacher Podcast family with my Google tip. I like to use Google Sheets instead of using Google Calendar to keep track of my daily activities and things like that as a coach. I do this because it takes a lot less time for me to just update one Google Sheet for the month than it does for me to add individual events on my Google Calendar. Then it's also easy to share with admin or for teachers to see where I am. So I've got an updated tracker in my show notes from episode 65 a long time ago if you want to check it out. Yeah, I've heard Pam talk about this a couple of times. This is a really clever idea. Um, swapping out sheets with calendar. Very good stuff. And Pam was very gracious, as she said, to give us an updated tracker. And so if you want to get the template, and then she's also got some notes with the new tracker linked to it. We've got links to both of those in the show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 119. So if you want to go check those out, we've got it all linked up. So thanks, Pam, for sending that in. Yes, that tracker is one of my favorites. Thanks, Pam. Laura Conway from Colorado, she left us a message, but it's more of a question, but it's a really good question to ask right now. So take it away, Laura. Hey, guys, this is Laura here. Um, I'm a teacher right now in Colorado, but I'm a military spouse and we're getting stationed overseas next year. So I have to leave my school district. Um I remember a few months ago, you talked about either an app or an extension where we could copy all of our school files over to our personal files in Google Drive um, instead of just like manually downloading every single thing. I just don't remember what it was and I couldn't find it anywhere on the website. I might just be looking for the wrong search word. So if you wouldn't mind reminding us what that either app or extension is where we can copy 
everything from our school files over to our personal Google Drive, I would really appreciate it. Thanks for everything you guys do. You are absolutely amazing. Have a great summer. Oh, okay. This is a huge reminder for everyone because this is the time of year when you may be transitioning. You may be moving. She's a military spouse, so she's going to be traveling overseas for the next school year, and she needs to take her Google stuff with her. So there is a program called Google Takeout, and it will allow you to download a zip file of all of your Google files. It's not exactly everything, but it's pretty much the most important things that you will want to take with you. So that is one way that you can transfer Um, open that zip file and then upload it into your new account. I also do a lot of sharing and moving things around between a personal account and a school account that will let you do a few things and you can change ownerships if you're the original owner of documents. But um, yeah, you want to make sure you're getting all of your stuff and you don't leave it behind. Yep, absolutely. Very good. Very good stuff to remember. Uh, This next one came in via email, so we don't have a voice message with this one, but it comes from Kim McClintic from San Antonio, Texas. And she asks, I would like to know if you have any suggestions for how to keep track of assignments that are turned into Google Classroom. I have a digital journal or notebook that I've had students doing uh, for a novel study. And every week I add new slides to their journal. However, If I'm still grading work that they turned in, they can't begin work on the new assignment until I return it to them. Do you have any suggestions for how I could assign work for them and allow them to continue working without me having to return the journal so that I can continue grading while they continue working? So if that makes sense, I think the the heart of this question is that whenever students turn in work through you know, by attaching a file to an assignment and then turning it in, then they lose access to it because the teacher then becomes the temporary owner of it. And then the teacher hangs on to it until they pass it on. And so I um, was kicking this around a little bit. And I think one solution might be this, that if you create that assignment and then the student shares a link to that journal in the private comments for that assignment, so all they do is they just grab, a, you know, like an edit link or a comment link that they can share in the private comments, then the teacher has access to it. And then whenever they're ready to turn it in, all they've got to do is just hit that turn in button. And then that way, they're not actually passing ownership of the file over to the teacher but the teacher still has access to the file because of the share link. So then you could go in and you could click on it and you can add whatever feedback that you want to. And then you can give the student the grade back and the te- the student has never actually passed ownership over to the teacher. So that's kind of one little workaround that I could think of. I'm sure there's lots of other ways to do it, but that's the first one that comes to mind for me. So Kim, thanks so much for, for asking that question. Our next tip is, I think pretty awesome. It's from Amber Hoke from North Carolina, and she is using Google Voice in a very interesting way. She's using it to record song stories for her students. So take a listen to this. Hi, Matt and Casey. My name is Amber, and I'm an elementary music teacher from Western North Carolina. And I wanted to share an idea that I use during this remote learning time. I've been using Google Voice for my students to call in and listen to a recording of me singing a song story. Then, if they want to, they can leave me a message. Since you can record up to nine different three-minute messages in Google Voice, I just switch out the songs daily so that students can call for a new song story each day. I also use the Do Not Disturb feature in Google Voice so that they could call anytime, and if they choose to leave a message, I would get a text translation of their message in my email inbox. It was fun and easy to set this up, and it really just allowed me to connect with my students in a different way, keep that communication going, and it required minimal effort from me. So hope you enjoy this idea about Google Voice. Amber, I think this is adorable. I don't know what grade you teach, but I'm guessing they're probably younger (laughs) than the ones that I used to teach. So I think this is fantastic. And I love that you're getting those responses, but you're keeping this uh, as a low 
a stress thing for the teacher. There's not a lot of work other than just recording it. You're getting those transcriptions if they respond to it. And how cute that the kids can call in to get the story of the day. I think that's a fantastic idea. Thanks for sharing that, Amber. Ah, uh, that was so good. Actually, that's probably a good place for us to wrap up right there. That's a good bow to put on this gift that you all have have given to to everybody is all of these tips. And so um, if you've got anything from this this episode that you want to get some more on, um, if you if there are any of the links that you want to check out, head on over to our show notes at googleteacherpodcast.com slash 119. So it's time to wrap up this episode with just a few blog posts, and then we're going to be putting a bow on this season of the podcast. So I've still got lots of free resources to my new book, Tech Like a Pirate. Uh, You can find those at techlikeapirate.com. It's all about using the classroom technology that we have to make learning unforgettable, to make it a memorable experience. Um, And of course, the book is available if you want to go check it out. I've also got a post that you can check out related to Google Sites, 20 Google Sites tips and tricks. This is one that we've updated recently with some new stuff. And so lots of good stuff here for you to go check out. And it's that time of year, y'all. We are wrapping things up, cleaning things up. You know, in last week's episode, we did a whole cleaning up Google Classroom and Google Drive episode. So I went ahead and added a link to my blog post that I just updated. So um, this is a post that I think originally came out last year. But anyway, I updated my Google Classroom cleanup tips with a little remote learning twist. So that's there for you. I've also got tons of free resources if you're interested in getting Google certified this summer. So with everyone needing to kind of take their Google skills to the next level, that is definitely something to look into. And I wanted to announce that I will be part of a virtual conference that is, I believe it's June the 5th, if I'm remembering the date correctly. So it should be this week as you're listening to this episode. It's called Get Your Virtual Lead On. So there is also Get Your Virtual Teach On. If you've heard of Get Your Teach On, this is the virtual version. And I'm going to be in the leadership conference. So um, I'll be doing a presentation there. But there are tons of great speakers. If you're a leader or you want to share this with your leaders, I would love to see you there. Okay, y'all, we made it. We made it to the season four finale. It was on fire, not because of us, but because of you. And I do feel like we had several mic drop moments in there. These are my favorite episodes. And I think that they are the most popular downloads in our entire history of the Google Teacher Podcast. So we hope you have enjoyed it, that you're walking away with tips and tools that are going to carry you through the summer and into the next school year. That wraps up this season of the Google Teacher Podcast. We're going to take a couple of months off in the summer to let you recharge and get your batteries reset for the new year as we will be doing as well. And then we'll get right back with you in the fall with another season. I think that wraps it up for another season. So we will catch you on the next season of the Google Teacher Podcast. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Podcast. Never miss an episode by subscribing wherever you listen to podcasts and by visiting our website, googleteacherpodcast.com. Join the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTPod. Until next time, keep harnessing that G Suite power and may the Googles be with you.